what's up everybody uh, welcome to the TRR artist series I'm your host Jonathan Michelle and we're here with the great Timbalero Ralph Erizeri um, we're actually here at the Willie Torres recording studios here in uh, Weehawken New Jersey where he's mixing his new album uh, which we're here to talk about I'm really excited about that welcome Ralph Thank you. Actually, I think this is Union City. Oh, <laughs> so we we uh, we took like fifteen steps. Exactly. How do we walk? And this is Union City, Bergen Line. So let's get right into it, man. Ralph, where are you from? I was born in El Barrio in Spanish Harlem, um, and I wasn't there a very long time. At the age of two, we moved to Brooklyn, and basically, I've made Brooklyn my home you know, most of my life, except for a period when I was 17, we moved to, well, I, I first lived in Brooklyn in Brownsville with Mike Tyson and all that, you know, it's a pretty rough neighborhood. And then my father wanted to get us out of that neighborhood, so we moved to South Ozone Park, Queens. In South Ozone Park, Queens was where I, I met this African-American brother named Billy Bryant, who turned me on to the descalgas in miniature of Cachao, mm. you know, these descalga records yeah. of Cachao. That turned my life around. Um, and while one day being there, uh, just hanging out, this guy named Charlie Butler, Puerto Rican guy, came. It was a mostly Italian neighborhood at that time. Um, I'm talking about early 60s. And he had a, a, a Mexican conga drum the one with the strap, you know, mm. and stuff. And he came and he said, yo, do you know how to play this? Or, you know, I said, no, but I remembered that when I was eight years old, there was a, a, a drug addict who owed my father $25. And he would hide from my father every time my father came, you know, from work. So finally he said, yo, I got th some timbales. I could give you for the $25 because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of avoiding you already. So my father said, yeah, that he'll take the timbales. It was that or nothing. And he brought the timbales to the house. And I remember when we got those timbales, I was eight years old. We always used to play on the, on the covers of the steams, you know, these like aluminum or steel covers that used to, uh, the steam from the house. And we always used to jam on that. There was always, we were always my sister and my brothers. When we got those timbales, they had the real calf skin. Oh yeah, sure. So we took these sticks off of the hangers, you know, the wooden hangers had these, these sticks and we banged the hell out those timbales and we broke the skins the same day. So they went into a closet and eight years later, I was 15, 16. This guy's asking me if I play any instrument. I remember that at some point, we had some timbales, so I went into the house, into the closet. I asked my mother, Mommy, where's, where are those timbales that we had? She said, I put them in the closet. So I brought them down. They were still, the, the skins were still broke. And uh, so I got uh, plastic heads. I went to 48th Street, Manny's, all those, 48th and Manhattan, where all those music stores were. And I bought some plastic heads. I put them on there. And I brought them and I changed the skins. And I told the guy, bring your conga, I got these timbales. And man, when I hit those timbales, something, something happened, something inside of me happened. It's like love at first sight, you know, I really dug it. I, I didn't want to have anything to do with girls or partying or going to parties or anything. My life was going to school and getting home as soon as possible so that I could go in my basement, take off my shirt, and put on whatever of the five or six or seven records that came out that week that I would buy. I mean, I would go to the record store and say, what came out this week? And at that time, Fania and all these other record companies, they were like factories. They got stuff coming out every month, you know, or every week. That's how I learned how to play with records. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I would, it's funny because one day I was so involved in, in practicing that I didn't see my father's wheels go by of the car. So I'm into it and I'm playing and for some reason or other, I turn around and my father 
was like at the bottom of the steps of the basement and he had like a tear coming out of his eye. You know, he had never heard me play because I used to stop, you know, he never knew that I was like getting into playing music. And, you know, and he told me after he saw me, he said, you know, you don't have to stop playing when I get home. You can continue to play if you want to, mm. you know? Yeah. So that was like a, a real special moment. I finally got my big break with Ray Barreto, mm -hmm. um, who after a two year absence of playing because he had broken his hand, uh, and that was when he was, you know, doing his Eye of the Beholder and all these other things where he, you know, wasn't playing the Cuchifrito circuit, you know, and he wasn't playing like dance music. He went into a little bit more of a fusion of what he liked because he loved jazz. Um, he decided to come back, so he had to make a band. After Ray Barreto, or while I was playing with Ray Barreto, I got off in the Ruben Blades gig. And let's face it, you know, this music is a singer's kind of ball game. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, yes, some of the greatest band leaders were not vocalists, uh, like Tito Puente and Ray Barreto and Mongo Santa Maria. But when you compare the impact that a Hector Laveau and Tito Rodriguez, and Mark Anthony, and Machito. You understand what I'm saying? It's a singer's ball game. And how long were you with Ruben? Well, I did a tour with Ruben about two years ago. Right. We did a world tour, the Todos Vuelven tour, which we, we, uh, we won a Grammy for, because it was the original members of Seis del Solar uh, with Ruben Blades. In other words, we weren't just a backup band, we were actually, you know, co-leaders of the, of the so-called group, you know? We were an artist in, uh, amongst ourselves. But um, from 1983, you know, Ruben Blades would always take, like he took a year off to get his uh, master's degree in international law at Harvard. You know, he filmed, he did about 20 motion pictures, you know. Uh, so on and off, I would say, you know, from 83 to, you know, 98 or 99. So, you know, a good 15 years, you know. And then every now and then we would do some special stuff. And uh, like I said, we did the reunion tour. Mm -hmm. Todo Buen Tour, which got all the original guys from 1983 together to do a world tour. Well, something interesting happened when, uh, when Ruben was getting ready almost to go another direction, which was, you know, uh, 96, 98 or something like that, I don't remember. He urged us and, and, and sort of told us, you know, you guys are great musicians instrumentalists. Why don't you guys do an instrumental group, like a Latin jazz group or something, you know? Uh, I think you guys would be good and you could, I, I would let you use the name, say that so lot, you know? So that people could, you know, identify who you guys are, you know? So we started to do that and Oscar Hernandez started to write some charts and Arturo Ortiz wrote some charts. He was playing synthesizers with, you know, synths, keyboards with uh, Seya Solar at the time, or Son del Solar. And so we got a little repertoire together of Seya Solar, the Latin jazz group. And we looked to find somebody to record us, but we didn't like get any interest. So Ruben Blades gave us the money to do our first recording. And he said, you know, I'll front you guys with the money. And when you, uh, when you sell it or you get a label or something, you can pay me back, you know? And that's exactly what happened. When we finally started doing touring with Seis de Solal, the instrumental Latin jazz group, 
<laughs> for once, I finally got how it felt to get applause for what we were doing without a singer up front. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt so great. You know, all these hours of rehearsing and practicing and all that stuff. When we started to get like sometimes standing ovations and stuff like that, and I look around, I said, did Ruben Blades just come out of the, you know, <laughs> why are these people applauding, you know? <clears throat> and it was actually for us. So once I got a taste of that, then I started to say, okay, I think I can, uh, I can put together something where, you know, the band is, is what's going on, you know? And then since I've never played traps, I knew it was gonna be a Latin jazz band, but in the true sense of the word, right. because there weren't gonna be no traps. It was gonna be timbal and conga. Mm -hmm. So then I sort of listened to Cal Jada's group with Mongo Santa Maria and Willie Bobo. Mm -hmm. And I used to, and, and I, I heard through records how they used to put those stages on fire with just two guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? If Mongo and Willie Bobo did this, I want to go that route, timbal and conga, you know, on steroids, sort of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and push that envelope and see what happens, you know? Okay. And that's when timbalaya came about. When I started playing music, you played with a group, and that was it. You didn't, you know, things were so good at that time where, you know, I used to do seven to nine gigs a week, you know, doubles and triple gigs a night, you know, with Ray Barreto and with other groups. You know, there were so many clubs. There was 150 clubs in New York City and like 15 bands. Now there's 200 bands and eight clubs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's sure. like a big difference, sure. a big turnaround. Yeah. So you didn't have to go around you know, playing with everybody you could find, you know. You basically, uh, and that's why all the groups had their own different sound also. Because you had the same musicians gig after gig, you know. So all the bands sounded different. Ray Barreto sounded like Ray Barreto, uh, you know, Willie Rosario, Gran Combo, Luis Pericolti, Tipica 73, you know. All the bands had their own sound, you know? It's not easy to have a distinctive sound of your own. And I feel Timbalaya has that. So, you know, why not, you know? All right, I don't have the name as like an Eddie Palmieri or a Ray Barreto, may he rest in peace, who used to get work because people knew, knew that because of that name, people were gonna come to the concerts. And they're in this to make money. If they put Ralph Rosario in Timbalaya, and I don't have a slamming record being played on jazz stations, they're not gonna hire me because they don't feel they're gonna get those people, those seats filled. But maybe this is the record that's gonna get a lot of airplay, because it has a lot of commercial potential without, you know, sacrificing, you know, the integrity and quality of the music. Man, I got, I got a good feeling about this one. So, you heard it from the man himself, Mr. Ralph Erizeri, here at the TRR Artist Series. Uh, looking forward to his new album celebrating the 20th anniversary of Timbalaya. Keep your ear out. Check us out at truthrevolutionrecords.com. Check out our podcast on iTunes. We'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>